My name is Paul Rusis of Agina. I am the house manager of the most luxurious hotel in the capital of Rwanda. So, uh, Corinne, we're going to be talking about perceptions and narratives, I think, today. Um, and as far as the West is concerned, I sometimes get the impression that the perception of Rwanda just hasn't changed for 30 years. Um, but your father's perception has certainly changed, your perception has changed. Um, for me, um, my perception has changed. So my first glimpse of Rwanda was in 1994 in July. Uh, when I um, was gathered with other journalists at the border with, uh, between Zaire, as it was then called, and Rwanda, uh, in Goma, and we were staring across to Rwanda where we knew that this horrific ethnic slaughter was taking place. Um, and Rwanda just looked so calm, so beautiful. It's a beautiful country, hilly, green, uh, the, the, the roads are smooth and wonderful. And Zaire, in contrast, was, you know, full of potholes and chaos and corruption. Um, and it, it, it was a, such a contrast to see Rwanda in that, in that pristine state and know what was going on. And I never met Paul Rusesabagina, your father. I only heard about him later. But uh, when I was there at the border in July, he was already um, saving people in the Mil Colleen Hotel in Kigali. He was the deputy manager who took over during that crisis, wasn't he? Yes, my father is a hero. He is an incredible man. And actually, during the genocide, I was one year old. I was a baby, and my sister was two years old. And we became orphans during the genocide. Both my biological parents were killed because they were Tutsi. Paul Rusesa Begina rescued me from a refugee camp, me and my sister. Then he adopted us, and he raised us as his own daughters. And it's an important detail um, uh, that your father is a member of the Hutu majority in Rwanda. Uh, and of course, um, it was from that Hutu community that some of the extremist militias who were ca carrying out that, that ethnic slaughter uh, were recruited. But I didn't actually know this until I met you in London, that you are a member of the Tutsi minority that was mainly targeted during the, that uh, genocide. That's correct. My, um, my father, in addition to adopting my sister and I, he saved 1,268 lives of Tutsis and Hutus inside the Hotel de Milkolin. And this is different than the, the story that the Rwandan government and uh, the dictator, Paul Kagame, wants to, the one single narrative that he wants the world to know. Um, my father is a Hutu who stood up and did not join in the killings, and he wasn't the only one. There are many other Hutus, but the Rwandan government wants to make it look like just this one single narrative, and my father's story changes and gives a different perspective um, to what truly happened. Because the, 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 uh, Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, has, has labeled your father as someone who's an extremist, a supporter of extremist Hutu ideology. He saved 1,268 lives. He tries to pin the genocide perpetrator, um, false accusations on him in order to silence him, as he usually does for any critic who is Hutu, who speaks up against Paul Kagame. He tries to make them out to be uh, to be um, genocidaires. Um, so the Rwandan Patriotic Front, Paul Kagame's rebel movement, 
um, took over the country in, in July 1994. Um, and as far as the outside world was concerned, this meant that the violence ended. Um, and I, my memory is, you know, that time that journalists, diplomats, aid workers were incredibly impressed by the RPF and by Paul Kagame. Uh, there was a sense of massive relief. The whole country was full of dead bodies. It stank uh, of rotting flesh, to put it br bluntly. Um, the, the schools, the, the stadiums, um, the churches were full of bodies. Um, so, at, at that stage, uh, immediately after the genocide, your dad's relationship with the RPF was actually not that bad, I gather. So, actually, every Rwandan and many people around the world hoped that whomever takes power after the Rwandan genocide would be a good leader. But we quickly learned that it wasn't the case. And in fact, Paul Kagame tried to assassinate my father immediately after the genocide because he didn't like that this man was being recognized as a hero. Was, was the book that he published, the memoir, an ordinary, I can't remember, it's called An Ordinary Man, yeah? Yes. Was that an issue, do you think? Yes, yes, actually, right, uh, and because he tried to assassinate my father after the genocide, we had to flee, to, to, to flee Rwanda and move to Belgium. My father, in his autobiography, he wrote about the dictatorship today, and one of the sentences he says is that the dances have changed, but the music remains the same. And that is a problem for Paul Kagame. And then we have the film coming out, Hotel Rwanda with Don Cheadle, and, um, and that makes your, your dad internationally recognized. And that, that also seems to have maybe been a trigger point. Yes. So my father used the platform that he acquired through the movie Hotel Rwanda to bring attention to the human rights abuses that the current government of Rwanda is perpetrating until today. And um, he tried to call for democracy, for the respect of human rights, for the respect of rule of law, for the respect of journalism. And so he used the platform that he gained through the movie to travel the world, go to conferences, schools, universities, churches, talking about it because the world seemed to be fooled by Kagame. And um, so your, uh, your father and you, the family, fled to Belgium and then eventually to Texas. Uh, and of course, he, 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 he wasn't the only person who fled in the decades that followed the genocide. Um, I mean, my book, Do Not Disturb, looks at a different group of people who fled after your dad, who were the members of the military regime, um, who fell out with Kagame, started to regard him as a dictator, were worried about the personality cult around him, and they ended up in exile, and, uh, and many of them have been targeted by the regime and assassinated. So you've got Patrick Karagaya, the former head of external intelligence, who was killed in 2014 in South Africa, former head of the armed forces, General Kayumba Nyamwasa, who survived an assassination attempt but has a bullet in his back that was in South Africa. So there's this whole pattern of people fleeing abroad, denouncing the Rwandan dictatorship. And then there's also a pattern in which the government reaches out, the regime rather, reaches out and, and grabs them, hunts them down, grabs them. Uh, and there's this sort of message that comes out from Kagame, and he's actually said this on stage at times, which is, you know, you can run, but you can't hide. So what happened to your dad then? Yeah, so as you just explained, Rwanda practices transnational repression. And my father, as he was speaking around the world, was being followed, of course. The assassination attempts continued even after we fled Rwanda. They've broken into our home, they've tried to assassinate him, they've tried to intimidate him, they've tried to silence him, but he was never intimidated. And he continued to speak out because he knew that he had a responsibility to speak up for the people, that the platform that Hotel Rwanda gave him he needed to be used to help the people who are being silenced and repressed by Paul Kagame. Unfortunately, he was kidnapped. Well, this was an extraordinary operation. I remember reading about it. I was thinking, what? Because he was lured onto a plane. First, he, he, was, he was sort of persuaded to fly to Dubai in the middle of the COVID uh, lockdowns, right? Yes. He, um, Kagame um, used an agent of his who presented himself as a priest because they know that my father is a very religious man. So the man approached him and had been working to gain his trust for two, over two years, and eventually invited him to speak at churches, at his delegation to churches in Burundi. My father agreed and he traveled with, he was lured from San Antonio, Texas in the United States um, to Dubai. In Dubai, he got to, on a plane. On the plane, he was drugged. And then instead of going to Burundi, the plane 
landed in Rwanda. Upon arriving in Rwanda, he was tied up by the legs, the hands, the, his eyes were covered, his mouth was covered, and he's almost 70 years old and he's already weak and has survived cancer. He was dragged out of the plane, thrown into a, a truck and taken to a torture house where he was held, tortured for four days, where after the four days he was, he forcefully signed confession, uh, false confessions because he was being tortured. And, and he, he was, was tried last year on the basis um, of those confessions and to nobody's surprise because the, you know, the family was expecting this, his lawyers was, uh, were expecting this, he got a 25-year jail sentence and I think that the US has just sort of given their view on, on that trial process. Yes, this were, I mean, he, my father was labeled a terrorist. As you know, dictators like to silence critics with false charges and made up um, accusations. And uh, there was a trial, it, there was a transparent trial, live on YouTube, we followed. Um, it was a show trial, and the US, the United States government, just last week, announced that my father is wrongfully detained um, and has categorized Rwanda, along with some of those other hostage-taking states, such as Russia, China, Iran, Syria, and Venezuela and others. And so now, formally, for the United States government, Rwanda is a hostage-taking state. Um, and what's it been like? Because you basically, you and your sister, who is also here today, and your brother, your family, your entire family have spent the last um, year, is it year and a half, campaigning for his release. What's that been like personally? Yes, yeah, so we have been doing everything possible, using every breath that we have to try to save my father's life. And we know that it's, as my father was never silenced, he knew that it was important to call attention to those abusers. We have been doing just that, trying to speak about it to the media, to um, organizations, to uh, whoever will listen to help us save our father. And I now too have become a, a target of this regime. Um, they have been following me physically, they're trying to intimidate intimidate me, they're trying to silence me so I don't advocate for my father. And one of the Rwandan government officials just tweeted that I deserve a golden machete. A golden machete? Yes. All right. Or, uh, Which is, uh, is basically a pretty horrific reference because of course many, m most of the dead maybe in 1994 were killed with machetes. Both my biological parents were slaughtered to death with machetes and right. making that, those references to me is inhumane. That's pretty, yeah. Um, and, and it's constant, I mean, I know myself from the day that my book came out, there is this very effective army of um, Rwandan trolls who I imagine are not real citizens at all. They're just being sort of doing their patriotic duty or being paid probably by uh, military intelligence. And they, they really go for, for anyone who criticizes the government or anyone who retweets. I'm often struck by people retweeting my stuff, get, get sort of an onslaught from these Rwandan trolls. Yes, and you'll, you can try it too, actually. If you tweet something about Kagame that isn't positive, you will all get attacked immediately. If you tweet something in support of my father, you will get an army of Rwandan trolls, probably all sitting in the same room, copying and pasting the same content to try to silence you and intimidate you into not speaking up against Kagame and not standing up for my father or other political prisoners in Rwanda. So they have a whole coordinated campaign to attack people and intimidate people. And you have, I understand that you speak to your dad five minutes once a week. How is he? What's, what's his condition like? Yes, we have this five-minute call, and it's, um, my father is not doing well. As you know, he was physically tortured. He was, um, he's being psychologically tortured, and then as we sit here today, my father is being tortured. Um, he, we just learned, he's also being deprived of his medication. We just learned that now there's evidence that my father has suffered a stroke. He has partial facial paralysis, and his lip is hanging. He has pain in his arm, pain in his jaw, pain in his neck, and I am frightened. I, I fear that every single day that we get this call that says that Paul Kagame has killed my father. Um, and in fact, we're trying to get a doctor, an independent doctor, to go see him, but the Rwandan government refuses for an independent doctor to go and examine my father. Right. What do you, I mean, everyone here is listening to your story. You're wearing this amazing T-shirt. I know there's a T-shirt campaign. Tell us about it. What do you want people here to go away? And if they, you know, if they support your campaign, what do you want them to do? Yeah, so I want the world to know who Kagame truly is. 
I want the world to stop supporting Kagame. I want you all to go back to your countries, to your government, to speak to your governments and tell them the truth about this dictatorship, that this is a dictatorship that silences innocent people, that, that kills poets, um, gospel singers, journalists, that gels um, whomever dares to speak out. And I want the world no longer to be fooled by this propaganda, this fake image that Rwanda is trying to put out there as a success story when in fact the country is repressed and needs our voice. And one way to do so is to represent. My father is um, currently a political prisoner in Rwanda. And if you wear this t-shirt, this will allow you to talk about it. To tell, to, this will create a conversation about it. Wear the t-shirt, post it on your social media, talk about it, get everyone to realize, to understand who this, what this dictatorship is like, and hopefully we can change things and this hopefully will also save my father's life. So it, help us save my father's it life. It seems Hollywood has rallied behind the t-shirt, right? Yes, yes. Now um, the Hollywood celebrities, the cast from Hotel Rwanda, have joined in to helping us advocate for my father. The cast from The Avengers, the Avengers are all wearing the t-shirts. Actually, the, I would say that the Avengers are coming to the rescue of one of their own. Um, and then uh, we also have NBA players. We have NBA coaches. Actually, one of those NBA players is in the room. Um, and uh, we... Uh, we are asking everyone to also wear the t-shirt and to help us raise awareness, help us bring attention to this, and help us save my father's life. Um, we must take a stand. We must not be afraid to stand up to, for justice and to stand up to dictatorships like Rwanda. Thanks very much, Corinne. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Corinne. I, uh, I'm, I'm here because we have to make an announcement, and the announcement is um, somewhat terrifying. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, there is a company operating out of the state of Israel called NSO, and it focuses on creating software that is sold primarily to intelligence agencies, including dictatorships. Uh, they are the people uh, that are responsible for the Pegasus virus. The Pegasus virus is, a, uh, is software that all they need is your telephone number. With your telephone number, without you clicking a link, without you receiving anything, just with your telephone number, they can take absolute control of a cell phone. They, can, they know everything that you have access to. If your phone has Pegasus, they have access to. They know who you call, where you are, they can turn the phone on at any time, they know everything that's happening. And uh, as part of uh, the interactive exhibits and the booths downstairs, Citizen Lab, an organization that works out of Canada and has been a pioneer and on the front lines of protecting activists and securing privacy, they have a booth downstairs. We have offered this booth to members of our community where you can go and in a matter of minutes, they can tell you if you have Pegasus on your phone. And uh, without connecting your phone to anything, they, they can inform you just by looking through some things if you have Pegasus. And there are two people in the Oslo Freedom Forum community that, that in, the, in the past 24 hours have been diagnosed as having Pegasus. Now, Pegasus costs a dictatorship about a million dollars per license. So it's a million dollar cyber weapon. And sadly, her phone was found to have Pegasus yesterday. It's active right now. Do you have your phone? Yes, and this is the second phone, actually, that's infected. Last year, Amnesty International conducted forensics analysis on my Belgian phone and discovered that I had the software. And this, yesterday, just yesterday, we learned that my US phone also currently has the spyware, which means that Paul Kagame is listening to us right now. You want to talk to him? <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> the applause was not for you, Paul Kagame. <laughs> the applause was for the fact that despite all of this, you have a sense of humor about this. Paul, we, we'd like to send you the love that your father never, never gave you. And we hope that you can, you can find and, and, and come to some peace and stop the activities that you're doing. That said, we will be removing Pegasus from this phone. <laughs> Also, release my father. 